Hello, can you hear me? Hello, good afternoon, everyone. Just testing the mic. Can you hear me okay? Good afternoon. No? Yes, I can hear. Can you hear me? Keep, I keep speaking. Okay. Yeah, can you hear me? Okay, I will keep speaking. I will keep speaking right now. Testing, 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 testing. Okay, now one, two, one, two, go. one, two. One, two, can you hear me? One, two. Yes, I can hear you, but where is that sound coming from? <laughs> okay, this is embodied voice. Sorry, this is Etienne ah, calling Etienne, in. Ah, Etienne, hi. We hear, you. we hear you very well. Thank you very much. Good, Okay, Thanks. do you hear everything okay? Okay, thank you so much. I think we will start our session. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this session um, organized by the FAO on climate risks to re water resources for food security, linking global, regional, and national responses. Thank you so much for joining us this afternoon. Um, so with agri-food sectors as one of the main users of water, climate change poses a serious threat to places around the world already faced with water scarcity and drought. So this event um, is meant to bring together global frameworks, regional approaches, and national actions that are attempting to address these risks. So we hope that this is a, an interesting and special session where we talk about national, regional, as well as global responses um, from a variety of partners and, and actors, some of whom are working very close to the ground. So um, we will have some opening statements, and then we will go to a video, which I hope will be really interesting, and then we will have a panel session. So my name is Teresa Wong, and I'm from FAO. I work at the FAO Regional Office for the Near East and North Africa as Climate Change Officer, uh, and I'm very happy to moderate this panel uh, with you, and, and also with this event in collaboration with both the headquarters in FAO and with uh, country offices. So um, without much further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, Amdihun, who is program, Regional Program Manager for Disaster Risk Management at, um, uh, in, at the Intergovernmental Authority on Development, IGAD, who will give a couple of opening remarks and set the tone for our session. Dr. Ahmed. Okay, very good, yeah. Good afternoon, uh, all. I hope I'm audible. Um, I have small remarks here. I'm going to read uh, briefly, particularly just to set uh, the tone. Uh, dear participants, ladies and gentlemen, uh, I would like to extend our appreciation of uh, four organizers, FAO, uh, and also thanks for inviting uh, IGAD, the Regional Intergovernmental Authority on Development. Uh, it's only fair, colleagues, uh, to give or to start with a bigger picture of global climate crisis and the sufferings of our people who have contributed uh, the least to the climate crisis. Uh, climate change is induced, uh, has been inducing disasters, particularly which knows no borders uh, whatsoever. Uh, and often impacts in a transboundary um, nature. The Horn of Africa, which is the epitome of climate crisis, uh, has been through several disasters. Uh, in a span of three years, the region has been grappling with COVID, as the rest of the world, massive desert locust surge with direct and indirect impacts, short-term and long-term impacts, flooding, multi-year flooding again, 
uh, and the ongoing uh, prolonged drought uh, disaster. Of course, this all marred with protracted conflicts uh, and insecurity. This all have been contributing to a massive, massive uh, disruption to the livelihoods, particularly as we speak, close to 50 million people are food insecure. Uh, this is, I think, uh, very much worrisome and uh, the, the ongoing drought is more or less uh, unheard of, at least since uh, or over the last 40 uh, years. Uh, such scale of crisis requires uh, not only humanitarian response, but more coordinated uh, responses, particularly global solidarity. Since this is beyond the capacity of individual states or uh, a region like IGAD. Uh, this is also calling for a candid and honest partnership. That's why we are all here. Uh, partnerships that ensures finances, including the resources, climate finances are accessible to the people on the ground. As per the report, which we heard yesterday, less than 10% of climate finance is reaching the local communities. This is, I think, uh, what is at stake. Uh, I want to conclude my brief uh, remarks with three paradoxes, just as food foretold. Uh, number one, in the Horn of Africa, humanitarian funding is increasing overall. But so does the number of people affected. This is the first uh, paradox. Uh, the second one is uh, the more fragile a region is, the less adaptation financing they are getting. Again, the second important uh, paradox that uh, we might deliberate on. The third one is, and the last one is, investment on early warnings and early actions has a return of tenfold as compared to managing a crisis. But still, we are choosing to fund and invest in early warnings for early action and resilience in general. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for those words. Um, I think you really set the scene for uh, also to talking about the region and the, some of the difficulties it faces that will be exacerbated by climate change, drought, and water scarcity. But you also talked about uh, the three paradoxes that also relate to uh, humanitarian uh, funding increasing, um, many people remaining to be affected, um, and the fact that we, when we know about early warning and the, the, the fact that it, it, it really um, yields great benefits and we're still not putting in place some of these. So I think we'll, we're going to afterwards go to some panelists who can speak to some of these issues. Uh, and you talked about climate finance too, and we want to, to also have a couple of panelists talk about how they have leveraged climate finance to address some of these issues at a nexus of uh, humanitarian and development uh, and also need for climate resilience. So um, right now, I'll ask our wonderful tech people at the back to go on to the little video um, that we're going to show on Somalia, and then we'll ask the panel to come up. Thank you. أديات بنو قفايد إسلامية ديجا في حورا كنال بق مركي ورا علير بنو هين في مكتر كان لوجش بق سهول يربا نو قصر دان سنا أديات بنو قفايد نون وفي عين بيها مقصر دان سنا بقول كيف بقول Kerana entik nara alat kau dengan kohor, pakai kunolajur nampak. 
ولكن مشروع عن كورتيغا فتحة هنا وجديد السوحة ويان إن بشدة بلد وين هي بيرلي دكوار رئيسن إن أي نقطة قوة كيستا تاتك صون نقطة نية الله جاهره أو حوية معنا ثاني كده كنا هذا معنيه إن سنة بضعة Adi ad by sefai umati ufianane sefiana ufianane siap hadine berharapna ina sedi isi kefian ahelno. Thank you very much. Could I ask the panelists to please please come up on stage? Um, I, I'm going to put the slide back up. Okay, so um, may I have um, the panelists to, f to, to please uh, come up on stage? We have uh, Etienne on, um, online. We have uh, Dr. Ibtissam, uh, Dr. Uh, Lopez Laval, and also Dr. Ahmed. Can we can we see if Etienne is online? Can we hear your voice, Etienne? Or maybe have you uh, show yourself? Hi, can Etienne. you hear me? Yes, we can. can you hear see me? You. Yes. Can you hear us? Can you hear me and see me? I I can see you and hear you. Can you hear yes, us? Yes, the bandwidth is a bit poor, but. Um, Sorry, Etienne. Yes, I can. You can. Can you hear us? Can you give us a thumbs up if you can hear us? Okay, excellent. I think it's just a bit of a lag. Um, but Etienne, we're going to pose the first question to you. Okay, so we've just come from the video that was shown uh, about some of the support that FAO is giving to Somalia. And in the video, we saw, um, you know, the sort of continuity of the threats. I think, you know, when uh, humanitarian response being also then thwarted by further uh, climate risks and floods and threats, so can you tell us a little bit, as you are really much on the ground, can you tell us about what, what the current food security situation is in Somalia? What are some of these main constraints that are hampering adaptation to climate change? Um, and, and also, can you sort of distinguish some of that, that the action on climate change from the humanitarian work that is going on? And can you also tell us a bit about the interventions um, at this local level that, that are being in place that we've, we've seen people benefit from in this video? Tell us a bit more. Over to you, Etienne. Great. Thanks a lot. And thanks for having me. Uh, let me just start uh, mentioning maybe a staggering figure. Uh, we have now today uh, 6.7 million uh, Somalis. That's almost half of the population that are expected to face crisis levels of food insecurity by the end of this year. The historical failure of four consecutive rainy seasons, and we are now uh, going into a fifth one, as well as persistent conflict, displacement, and high food prices are pushing people in, in Somalia to the brink of famine. 
the current situation is already worse than the one we witnessed in 2010-2011 and the one we witnessed in 2016-2017, uh, both in terms of duration but also severity. That's something we haven't witnessed in recorded history. The world obviously cannot wait for a famine declaration to act. Uh, by then it will, be, it will be too late. We know that uh, in 2011, half of the almost 260 people who lost their lives had actually already died by the time the famine was declared. At least half of them were children. This, this poor rainfall and intense dry conditions have led to acute water shortages, substantial uh, reduction in crop cultivation, failed harvest, and the loss of uh, millions of livestock that are essential to Somalia's pastoral and agro-pastoral livelihood systems. And has also displaced hundreds of thousands of families from their homes in search of water, food, uh, pasture, and humanitarian assistance. Let me also add that about 1.8 million children under five will likely face, fat, face acute malnutrition through mid-2023, of which uh, 513 who are expected to be severely malnourished. So th this is clearly a reflection of the increasing trend of climate events, be it droughts, but also floods that have affected the ability of Somalis, particularly, I must uh, specify, rural families to meet their needs. Now, regardless of the performance of the anticipated rain, and I've already mentioned that the, the ongoing wind is poor, the recovery from a drought of this magnitude will take years with extremely high humanitarian needs to persist and even increase way into 2023. Many people have already completely lost their livelihoods and coping capacities and are relying heavily on assistance to meet basic needs, which will challenge the drought recovery. The fact is that drought-affected rural Somali uh, Somalis are the human face of the, of the global climate emergencies. Now, in, in, with regards to the, 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 some of the constraints that are hampering adaptation to climate change in Somalia, of course, there are, there are multiple and, and overlapping difficulties that, that do constrain uh, Somalia's ability. Uh, one is the gaps in institutional capacity, uh, policy making, and, and, and poor governance due to the many years of persistent conflict and chronic underdevelopment that uh, have played a role in, in, in Somalia's ability to plan and, and, and implement climate strategies successfully. And many of the building blocks uh, appearance in other contexts need to be rebuilt first in, in order to uh, successfully implement climate adap adaptive strategies. A lack of uh, large-scale investment into climate resilience, food producing sectors, and the historic trend of short-term humanitarian aid over resilience and development priority definitely poses uh, also a great challenge. This temporary approach has left productive sectors weak and also vulnerable to climate shocks as well as economic shocks. We're also seeing this at the local level where families have been forced to cope with increasing incidence of uh, climate events. Uh, for, for, for many millions of Somalis, the, their ability to withstand climate shocks has been entirely degraded, let alone their ability to adapt to the changing world uh, around them. And, and we can talk later about uh, pastoralism as a, as a way of living and how sustainable that is. If Somalia, the humanitarian donor community, do not invest in, in livelihoods, but also resilience, infrastructure development, climate adaptation, and durable solution to ensure Somalia's young and growing population can adapt and thrive in the future, then the country will simply become even more vulnerable to the impacts of a globally changing climate. Consequently, Without such investment, we, we should expect to see more events like that which we are witnessing in the current in, in the country at the moment. And these increasing trends tell us that they will be become more commonplace. Now, maybe let, let me just add also um, something around the, 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 the historical trend of climate change and, and how it has impacted communities in Somalia. Now, we know that much of... Uh, Somalia's rural population live in arid and, and semi-arid areas where rainfall comes seasonally a few times a year. These rainy seasons are, are in fact, the lifeline of, of rural communities. Yet, since the early 2000s, these patterns, which Somalis have depended on and trusted in for hundreds of years, 
have begun to change. You know, Somalia, just to give you a, a, a sense, Somalia has faced climate shocks in 20 out of the last 22 years. And those were alternating, alternating between floods and drought. And even we have seen now recently, we have, we have noticed, noticed increases in tropical storms and, and cyclone. Rural communities are obviously the worst affected by these, by these changing climate trends. Low adaptive capacity and high exposure risk to these shocks has put them on the front line of the climate dis uh, disaster. Difficult decision must be made for, for, for their survival and damaging practices such as the encroachment of floodplains, charcoal production of forests, and overgrazing occur as communities do whatever they can to ensure a future for their children. Yet these, practice, these practices can also contribute to great exposure to climate-related risk. I'll take the example of deforestation that is being conducted during lean seasons that can lead to flash flooding and destruction of crops when the rain doesn't come. But as we are seeing in the, in the current disaster, when we are on the doorstep of the famine again, vulnerable rural communities simply cannot keep up with these recurrent shocks from their own resources, which have been drained dry. Obviously, real action needs to be taken to help communities meet the needs of the present, but also safeguard uh, livelihoods for whatever the, you know, the, the, the future will bring. No, again, maybe also just a point on on how this these intervention, including those we have seen in, in the video, uh, how at local, regional, and federal level can 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 they make communities more more resilient? Now, the the, the climate change modeling uh, that 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 we have also uh, established here in within within FAO it tells us that as global temperature rise food security is going to be negatively affected, increasingly so, Particul particularly in already vulnerable countries like, like, like Somalia. There is uh, obviously an urgent need to develop sustainable and also resilient food system and livelihood opportunities that can stand the test of climate variability and the degradation of natural resources. Now, to better prepare for these climate impacts, firstly, there is a need to invest more in the generation of early warning information at federal, state, and local level that will help anticipate floods. I mentioned before tropical storms, droughts, and other shocks that affect the country, and including the, the desert locust uh, infestation uh, that we witnessed a couple of years ago, well, recently. Uh, the, the existing early warning system need to be strengthened, again, at all levels, including at the community level. Now, for, for farmers and pastoralists, th th there is a need to diversify where and how they get their water for their crops, livestock, and, of course, their families. They need access to different water sources throughout the wet and dry season, typical in those regions. And for that, substantial investments in water infrastructure need to be prioritized in areas where this requirement can be met, again, reference to the, to the video we've, we've, we've just seen. Integrating land and water management, factoring climate change into policies and investment, and working towards sustainable and inclusive food systems are key to Somalia's adapt adaptive capacity to cope with and thrive into the future. It will translate into increased productivity of farmland and rangelands across Somalia's very diverse agroecological agro zones and reduced need to migrate, such as we are seeing today with over a million uh, displaced people by the drought alone. But it also requires responsible investment in broader areas, such as the local fishing industry, and also involving women and youth as decision makers and leaders. At the federal level, priorities for adaptation need to be defined by decision makers and leaders. Viable strategies and policies specific to Somalia are needed for it to ensure a viable future resilient to the global climate crisis. Now, I'll finish by saying that government must be in the driver's seat, with the international community supporting Somalia's climate adaptation ambitions. Like many countries in Africa, and as was mentioned in the introduction by the colleague from IGAD, Somalia has contributed the least to global climate change, but it's 
suffering its worst consequences. Let me stop here. Back to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Etienne, for those words, um, for painting us um, a picture of what's going on in Somalia, as well as then transitioning to the, the risks to, um, of climate. Um, what struck me from what you said was that um, the ability of the country to plan and implement national adaptation plans is greatly impeded by the, by the lack or the destruction of these building blocks um, for development that are, that are still not in place or not adequately in place. So for me, that really brought home the message that, um, for example, the integrated land and water management approaches, the, 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 the attempts to create resilience must, in, uh, the, to, the, the attempts to also like, um, to, to in include climate are, are, are those that need to also improve uh, resilience. So I think this is a, a package that needs to be looked at. Uh, humanitarian and, and these integrated programs need to include climate and need to build resilience. So I'm, I'm hearing that a lot. And, and I'm also coming back, I think, to our panel um, to ask Dr. Ahmed to respond to this uh, as, as, uh, and also to answer a couple of questions that might also um, uh, link to what you just said, Etienne. Um, so for, for Ahmed, and thanks for putting, letting me put you on stage so soon after the opening remarks, um, is to ask you what, 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 what would be the, some of the main policies to enhance country capacity to address some of these climate shocks that Etienne also uh, alluded to um, and, and that we know are, are happening. Um, and what are your views on, on how to articulate humanitarian aid in these large-scale investments in climate? And do you have a couple of uh, examples uh, to show us, to add to the one that we just had on Somalia? Thank you. Um, Hello. Okay. Uh, thank you very much. I think, uh, uh, colleagues, uh, the, the critical, in terms of policy, I'm talking from a regional point of view as an uh, intergovernmental body. Uh, the issue of policy and strategy is, I think, done. Even looking at Somalia, they have a robust uh, disaster risk management strategy, a robust water resource management strategy, climate change strategy, development plans, so the critical step that needs to be reinforced is implementation. Uh, that's, I think, where uh, the real um, you know, solidarity, the real support uh, need to come. Uh, if I just give one example of uh, the National Disaster Risk Management Strategy of Somalia, uh, it spins around four priorities. The first one being risk knowledge, understanding the climate risks and non-climatic risks. The second one is strengthening governance issues, which is, I think, very, very important. The third one is calling for investment. How can we invest? Like the video we see, community-based investments for building resilience. And the fourth one is on uh, capacity, particularly uh, capacity for response uh, at a national level and subnational level. So in terms of policy, I think we are very much in advance because over the last three years, we are also very happy as IGAD uh, to report that we have supported Somalia to have their national DRR strategy revised. This is back in 2019. Uh, the second most important point is on the humanitarian um, uh, uh, agenda, particularly how we frame uh, the humanitarian uh, agenda. I think we all agree that uh, in the face of 50 million people you know, being food insecure, we can't still skip or ignore the humanitarian crisis and the urgency of this issue. However, going forward, the critical thing is as we do the humanitarian, the most important thing is how we can invest also in the mid-term and long-term resilience building. That region particularly, over the last 40, 50 years, is moving in circles. Disaster after disaster, humanitarian uh, emergency, one after the other. Uh, so going forward, I think we can't keep on doing this. As I said, one of the greater, greatest paradox is the funding is increasing and the number of people affected are increasing. That means something is wrong. So that is, I think, uh, the critical call which I would like to put. Uh, coming to the last one, giving maybe one or two, three examples. Uh, Community-based investments like uh, the FAO practice with local communities is one of the best ways, actually, of addressing climate risks. IGAD also have piloted in parts of Kenya, particularly in arid parts of Kenya, where we have worked with communities with little as half a million USD investments 
we managed to demonstrate what we call climate resilient livelihoods. I think such pilots need to expand it, but also we have to think about scaling. How can we scale these pilots? That's very important. The second one is, uh, and the last one from my side is on nature-based solutions, particularly how can we bring in that element of ecosystem-based uh, approaches towards advancing uh, building resilience. Because at the end of the day, uh, the dividend is in investing on the environment, whether it's water or securing food or so on. The most important thing is how can we um, base our assumptions and our practices based on uh, the ecosystem services, okay? How can we restore or how can we protect uh, the ecosystem services, which are quite important in whatever we do, whether that's community-based investments, large-scale infrastructure development, and so on. I think uh, that's the central uh, from my point. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ahmed, for this very, um, uh, very targeted um, intervention. Uh, you mentioned a couple of things. Um, you said you talked about the robust strategy. So I'm hearing this whole: Do we, are we, we keep planning, or there maybe there isn't the, the the right ability to plan? And you also say that Somalia has robust strategies in water and DRR, and that the most important thing is implementation. Um, and you also mentioned that you were the, that some of the most effective strategies were heading towards climate resilient livelihoods and, and trying to incorporate ecosystem services and nature based solutions. Um, and the, the question that you had is how to scale this up, how to, to make the, the, pro the proper and what Etienne said responsible investments uh, in order to scale up some of these actions. So uh, I want to turn to and there will be a time for questions afterwards and I'm sure you are saving all your questions up for the Q&A. But I want to turn to uh, Dr. Ibtissam Abu Haja, who's the Director of Climate Change and Drought Management, Ministry of Agriculture in Palestine. Uh, and Dr. Ibtissam has been uh, a partner for, with FAO, or has, um, has seen FAO as a partner in Palestine, and with some success also in translating some of these priorities that have been identified for managing the impacts of climate change in drought and water scarcity into implementation, into action, and particularly into climate finance. So we'd like to hear a little bit from how you translated these priorities uh, and what, what was needed to, to bring this um, as a proposal for, for uh, financing. <coughs> Thank you for uh, asking this question because we are proud in Palestine to show that we have a step a little bit up further uh, the preparation, the basis uh, for, for the climate change where we have, of course, done our NDCs uh, adaptation plan, uh, action adaptation plan, all, all the, the, the bases that are needed so that we can step one, one step uh, to the uh, implementation. <coughs> of course, uh, trying to go to the finance is, uh, is a very difficult uh, step to be done. Uh, not because of the time that is or needed for uh, preparation of the of, of the concept that because might take you two or to have two, two to three years just uh, preparing the concept note and then you have to go to the de detailed uh, proposal and all these these steps in addition to that also in Palestine we have to go with a plan about the political barriers because you know because of the occupation we all have to all, always to have plan a plan b plan c if there a demolition has happened uh, during the implementation of your project or uh, there is a closed area that happens so this <coughs> added also a uh, burden on the palestinian in how they can uh, manage this concept note but uh, gladly we are we, um, we have several projects that has been uh, approved by the green climate fund by the nam by the by the nama and also uh, we have other projects in the preparation phase uh, our first project that we has uh, had been again by the green climate fund we call it uh, water banking this project is uh, implemented in gaza and it is about uh, trying to uh, provide Gaza with the uh, pr proper water quality because of the deterioration of water uh, there. And this uh, project is between uh, Ministry of Agriculture, P Palestinian Water Authority, AFD, and uh, the uh, FAO also. They were our also partner in this, in this project. And this project we, fought, we, we would like to call it is a success story because we were uh, in this period uh, the United States has bought a veto in the Palestinian in the Green Climate Fund, but uh, through the, the fight 
through the uh, French government, we, we, we got this project and it was the first project we got it. Uh, also, we have a readiness project with the Green Climate Fund. It's about uh, climate resilient. Uh, and hope it's, a, and it's also it has two parts about it in th about the early warning system it was an important step to Palestinians to be able to improve their uh, sk the, their skills and the farmers capabilities in and be, be more prepared for the uh, climate conditions that are unexpected in the country and also to improve the and improve the capacities of the agriculture engineers working in the ministry and in the uh, private sector to be more capable to deal with the climate conditions uh, the technologies and all these aspects. Uh, the third project is the NAMA project. It's called the low carbon uh, value chain of uh, olive oil. Uh, and this project in the process of hopefully signing the agreement after four years of uh, preparation and uh, development. And also now we are preparing uh, for another project. It's called uh, Barj Sanur watershed, and uh, last uh, month we had uh, a great inf uh, information from the Green Climate Fund that the proposal, uh, the the idea, is is very good, and they are happy with it, and they said us please uh, start uh, developing the, uh, the the concept note, and all of these projects, of course, are uh, implemented uh, by the Ministry of Agriculture through uh, the whole support of the of the FAO. That's that's all our project now. <laughs> Thank you, um, Dr. Itisam. If I may, I'm, because you are our friend, we will ask you a follow-up question. What would be your one or two recommendations since you have been successful in accessing some of these funds? I know even through some difficulties, uh, political difficulties, you have also, your um, country has managed to access some of these funds. How would you recommend other countries or people seeking to, to follow this example? Uh, what is one or two things you would recommend that they do to help them prepare to ex uh, uh, access funding? First of all, uh, when you go through the concept note and the, uh, the, 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 the concept note, don't be afraid of all the data that it, it's needed to, to fill it because you will be able to, to do it. Uh, second of all, you need to have, uh, a, a co you, have to, you cannot work alone. This uh, concept should be uh, done in, uh, in a more uh, uh, cooperative conditions. You have to work with all sectors that are related. You have to work with all people that are related. For example, when we are preparing our proposals, we work with all uh, uh, with all uh, actors in the agricultural sectors because they can give us advice, they can give us more information about how to develop uh, these, uh, these proposals. And the third uh, advice, be patient. Don't lose it and be patient. You need time to, to develop a proposal and to accept it. <laughs> Thank you very much, uh, Ibtisam, for, for giving us some of these tips. Um, I think there, there is definitely a lot to be done to lay the groundwork for some of this funding. It doesn't come uh, so quickly. We know and we have many sessions, I think, in this conference about accessing climate finance, the need for climate finance. Um, but I think there are several steps ahead. And that if you can plan ahead and, and cooperate and get the needed data at the agricultural su subsector level and combine that with the needed uh, higher level climate data, for example, and you might be setting yourself also on the path to, towards uh, the requirements needed for these. So thank you again for that, uh, Dr. Ibtisam. Um, so I think our, f our final speaker from the, the panel, um, but this is not the end of your interventions because we might still have a bit of a back and forth. Um, we'd like to hear from Dr. Augusto Becquera Lopez Laval, Chief Scientist of the International Center for Biosaline Agriculture, ICBA. Um, and uh, the question to you, and uh, maybe after hearing all the interventions, um, so how is saline agriculture response to water scarcity, and what is the added value of uh, ICBA's participation in the Global Framework on Water Scarcity in Agriculture, also known as WASAG, um, which, uh, which you lead in the Working Group on Saline Agriculture? And so this is the global question to you. What are some global responses and opportunities to work together on drought and water scarcity? Thank you, Teresa, for the question. And uh, I'll start with the last point. I mean, why ICBA is leading this, this group? Because ICBA has 20 years of experience working with saline solutions and, and developing a framework for uh, placing the importance of uh, working with uh, um, areas of the world that are depleted by natural resources. And um, with, obviously, the partnership with FAO, 
with the um, uh, ICARDA, with IMI, uh, and other organizations within the region, we've been able to, to sensitize and work on the base. I mean, you were mentioning very rightfully that one of the major um, uh, aspects to be tackled is working with communities. So um, ICBA has led two um, webinars, one on soil and water management in saline conditions, and the other one is on the use of uh, saline tolerant crops in, in marginal environments. So those two webinars ignited the need for developing guidelines for farmers to actually implement solutions on the ground. And these guidelines are being developed uh, using very simple language, but uh, placing the importance of technology and transferring the technology to them. So these two um, 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 documents are ready, and that also highlighted the importance of updating the list of crops that are saline tolerant. And because the, the last update is probably 20 years back, and so now uh, with the help of FAO, we are updating that list of tolerant crops so that solutions for you know, adapting to, to climate change, and remember that one of the major aspects of the climate uh, change is salinization of soils. And, and because um, people are stepping into the, into the water reservoirs, which are now heavily saline, and uh, rain is coming not as frequent as it should be, and 95 of the uh, customers that we have, 95% of the customers we have as smallholder farmers, we live out of rain-fed agriculture. So then this, these topics are being highlighted. We're working on the early warning system for salinity. And, um, and um, so I think there's more work to do. So the, the working group is, is active. Uh, next meeting is coming soon. So and, uh, we're working hard on it. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Lewis. Um, I think you you know the solutions that IGBA offers is also sort of the research and the, the knowledge and know-how on salt tolerant crops and um, the kind of the kinds of practices that would address some of the issues and the problems that we face uh, in in sort of building resilience to climate change. Uh, so I think uh, making sure that these efforts, uh, making all this solutions known to countries is also one of the, the reasons for having a global network and for for us to be part of this uh, the global exchange um, okay so I this brings us to the first the end of the first round of our, our, our a couple of statements from you um, do we have any reflections now hearing from each other that you might have and then I will also open up to the floor if you have questions um, and if, yeah Please prepare your questions, and then if uh, panelists have any reflections on what uh, what each other has said, including Etienne as well, if you're still with us. Uh, Etienne, would you like to say something? Yeah. I just want to say that hearing all of, all of us talking, we found out that we are we are suffering from the same the same problems, even though that the solution could be could be different. Plus, I think this this could be also a step that we should start thinking, not at the at the at the, at the local level, especially that everybody talking about that the uh, green climate fund, the adaptation fund is for at the local level is the minimum. So I think as we are fa we having the same problems why not to start to think at the regional level global level so that we can be able to be more stronger to get uh, to be able to uh, go ahead with all these funds and be able to be making this project and get out of these benefits rather than going locally thank you do we have any questions from the floor Yes, please. Uh, can we have a mic to this gentleman? Thank you so much for your help. Please identify yourself as well. Thanks. Okay. Um, thank you very much. My name is Najib Ahmed, and um, I am I'm from Somalia. First of all, allow me to thank FAO for organizing this important session. Um, the climate injustice my people are suffering deserves deserve to be heard not only hearing, but also the service to be responded. Um, allow me also to thank the great panelists, Mr. Augusto, Ibtisam, and Mr. Ahmed, and also um, Etienne. Your remarks, your thoughts was brilliant, and I'm glad that um, 
this is also receiving um, the global attention. Um, I also like to reiterate two th points before I ask a question. Number one, uh, Mr. Etienne said that in his remarks that the government must be at the driving seat. And I want this to be uh, integrated and mainstream in all the interventions that to be implemented. Uh, also, Mr. Ahmed said, I mean, and this is the nexus between the resources we have vis-a-vis -vis the low adaptive capacity, and this is comes back to the meaningful support Somalia needs. And uh, my question now comes to equally for FAO and ICBAC, IGAD. Um, it is a rare opportunity to meet with them, combine, and I think this is the right time also to ask. One of the way forward solutions is Ahmed uh, presented, and this is what we all normally advocate for, is um, the early warning system, the climate information or the climate services. And um, for your information, both ICBAC, the regional body of IGAT, and FAO provide climate information, climate support to Somalia. And I was wondering if this is the right time to think about paradigm shift putting the government in the driving seat and also supporting meaningful translation of data and information into to support our decision making so that we avoid we avoid um, climate disasters and climate crisis with that thank you very much and sorry to take uh, much time thank you very much um, thank you very much for your I think questions. Can we just take one more, just in case? Um, okay, we. No, oh, no, no. We have three. <laughs> Heb, Heb, uh, so Heba first, and then the gentleman. So you have to remember all the questions. <laughs> That's right. Okay. Yes. Uh, thank you. I'm Heba Al Hariri. I'm uh, uh, from FAO RNE. I just have uh, one question uh, to the panelists uh, with regards to uh, the climate finance. We always hear that um, actually the countries, they don't have the adequate capacity to apply for climate finance or even to receive sometimes the, uh, these types of finances. So my question to you is what are the main considerations from your point of view to enhance the system's capacity? Because we often hear about enhancing the individual capacities and we have lots of programs on that but what are the main considerations and indicators that are needed to analyze the system's capacity and to work on enhancing these capacities to be able to receive those funds? I have another one question directed to Dr. Ibtisam uh, with respect to um, the mainstreaming of climate change into the national adaptation plans. Um, with respect to the climate projections, how are, what were the main uh, maybe uh, tools that were used to ensure that the climate projections that we have are actually translated into uh, actions that needs to be integrated within the national adaptation plans? Because this is also a very challenging point that we usually uh, see that it's not easy to overcome. So what were your considerations? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Heba. Could you pass the microphone, I think, to the, oh, uh, the gentleman in front? Do uh, you guys fight amongst yourself? Who <laughs> I'll give it to you. <laughs> OK, one after another. You're next. Thank you for your, your comments. My name is Amos Winter. I'm a professor of mechanical engineering at MIT. And a, a lot of my research is focused on um, uh, low power, solar power, drip irrigation, and also desalination. And I wanted, I heard a number of comments about uh, local, you know, farmer level solutions as well as salt tolerant crops. And I was wondering if you could comment on the opportunity or need of desalination at an individual farm level or regional level and how that could play a role in improved food security. Thank you. Okay, thank you for a chance. I'm uh, Adam Bosch from uh, Sudan. Dean of Scientific Research in As Salaam University, Sudan. Uh, I think a great challenge for the agricultural sector is to produce more food under water scarcity conditions, particularly in arid and semi-arid uh, regions. And uh, food security is closely linked to uh, climate change and uh, water scarcity. 
so it is time to uh, uh, make action for a climate change. It is time to catch each drop of water. Anybody is responsible for that, to catch everybody and to maximize these uh, drops of uh, water. Uh, so uh, uh, we should have to train the rural uh, uh, farmers or the farmers in rural areas. Uh, also, uh, uh, you should uh, uh, train and uh, the rurals uh, should not have sufficient knowledge about water management and uh, when to irrigate and how much water applied. In case, uh, when uh, to irrigate, this is a question. How much uh, water applied? Uh, so it is not the quantity of water applied to create. I'm a agriculturalist. I'm not the quantity of water applied to a crop. It is the quantity of intelligence what should determine the result. This is better due to intelligence than water in Africa. So you can concern about the water management to save water resource and to maximize water. Thank you. Um, thank you very much. There are quite a lot of diverse questions, so I will let the panelists pick ones that they would really like to address. But I also want to say that we do have a, a, a kind of a last speaker slash closing. Um, also, who might, uh, Jean-Marc might address some of the, the questions on maybe regional uh, initiatives towards water management and water harvesting. But um, let's, let's have the panelists um, address questions that they may, may wish to, and then we will try our best. If not, we, we definitely can talk a bit more afterwards. So I'll address the, the question about the crops and the use of saline water and you know the natural resources. I think it's very relevant. So w w one of the, the, the biggest challenge that we have is that we need to diversify the food system. So the food system rely only on three big, co big commodities, rice, maize, and, 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 and wheat. And we need to diversify the system so that other crops are improved in order to to, to maximize the output of farmers. And uh, saline, the salinization um, is, is, a, is an option, but we need to manage the waste of the salinization. And so where the salt is going to be a store, how it's going to be a store, so that's a, that's a big issue. So whether we make plants more tolerant to salinity or we desalinate the water and don't worry about the plants. I think it's a, it's a combination of two, of two scenarios. Uh, we need to find novel methods for desalination, and I think biodesalination, for instance, is pending. is a, is a, is a big open opportunity for the scientific community to develop innovations there. But most importantly, uh, the solution will come from extending the, the reach of the type of different crops that we can actually uh, uh, grow, and then bringing the forgotten foods and practices back to, to agriculture. So I think this is important too. Uh, I, I will I make a general comments and on, on most of the question. The first one about, uh, for example, the government should always lead uh, the climate change uh, finance process because they are more capable in uh, bringing all the actors uh, at the same table and give th make them uh, give their best because uh, they can can they can't control control everything and it will make it much easier for them if they take the lead process. Uh, the uh, role and let the other do the implementation, do the, the planning and all of these uh, processes. Of course, for uh, the climate uh, projection in, 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 of course, the data in, in, in Palestine related to, to, to the data, we have a lot of gaps in our, in our uh, data uh, files because, you know, we have three eras of, uh, <laughs> in, in Palestine, we have the Jordanian era until the uh, uh, then we have the, the Israelis and the occupation. So there is a huge gaps in our information in our data. We are in the now we have uh, developed through the FAO and through our project, it's, which is implementing 2030s, where we have uh, many of the information.
information and the data we have extract them through the Wapur and they help us in developing some of these uh, uh, projection all of these uh, models so that when we apply to all these final to all these uh, funds we show them that what is the gaps and what is going on and of course we are concentrating on the uh, temperature and, and and rainfall and I think in the in the in the coming period we also will start to talk about the wind and the wind speed and directions because they are now became a huge problem in in, in Palestine especially uh, during the uh, the winter season because we ha start to have what's so called the uh, eastern wind and this is increasing uh, the evaporation and increasing the irrigation water needs even in the in the winter uh, the season much uh, thank you and uh, I would like to address two questions the first one is on uh, uh, making governments to lead, I think in Somalia, uh, as IGAD, actually IGAD is, uh, Somalia is one of the member states and uh, that's exactly what we have been doing. Uh, for example, for Somalia to have uh, an independent uh, MET agency, ICPAC really have done uh, quite significant efforts, uh, starting from the experience sharing from the countries and bringing also many sectors together so that Somalia uh, can establish a national uh, made uh, agency. Uh, we are in full support of, I think, uh, Najib, that, uh, that uh, idea of, you know, governments to take uh, the lead, particularly in, uh, not only on the MED sector, but on all national, um, uh, national uh, agendas. Uh, on the question on the need, on the capacity need, particularly to access finance, uh, I think it's both ways. Number one is such institutions like ICPAC, for example, one of the best regional center. I'm calling it the best because it's a designated WMO regional climate center. Uh, the, we are now on the second year or so <laughs> going through that uh, very rigorous uh, process of accreditation. Uh, what now is that for national and subnational institutions? Uh, it's not only you know, the issue of capacity, but the issue of, I think, uh, very long procedures uh, to, to get accredited. But uh, our strong recommendation actually for um, African institutions particularly is there must be a way to fast track uh, their accreditation so that these finance are accessible to people who, are, who need them the most, uh, particularly the most vulnerable uh, communities. So uh, in terms of capacity, we are, as many other organizations, we are also supporting actually countries uh, on um, how they can be accredited to uh, uh, to these climate finances, both adaptation and uh, GC, the GCF. Huh? But the real issue is really not capacity per se. Some are very advanced at the national level, and some of the countries, in fact, their uh, national institutions, ministries, have been accredited already. They are accessing the funds. So why not for others? So it's a matter of coherence, consistency, and also cutting short the very long... Uh, uh, procedures um, in both institutions and beyond, of course. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed. Um, we are running a bit out of time, but I'll just ask Etienne if he has just a very, very quick and brief statement addressing any of the questions. Etienne, if you can hear us and give something really brief. If not, we will go to closing. Yeah, no, thanks. Thanks very much. Uh, just, just to the point of uh, uh, the Somali uh, participant. Yes, yes, indeed. Uh, I think one, one very positive uh, move the government has taken is the creation of the Ministry of Climate Change and Environment. Uh, it, uh, with regards to uh, capacity building and, and empowerment and transfer of capacity, just to mention that uh, FAO's uh, uh, Swalim project, the Somalia Water and Land Information Management, is going through a process of, uh, of transfer to the government. Now, just briefly, we uh, Swalim provides information on, on water resources. Um, we have uh, various um, you know, data information looking at irrigation, seasonal climate variation, uh, river gauging networks, we have weather monitoring networks. Uh, we also provide uh, information on land resources, both at national and regional level, uh, gathering um, and, and, and producing data on land use, land suitability, land forms, land cover, land degradation, surface geology and soils. I mean, there's a lot of, of, of work also on GIS that we are, produ uh, are producing uh, in terms of innovative uh, remote sensing technologies and, and also all this, uh, as I said, capacity building. So that's uh, a commitment and that's a work in pro progress, so really to empower uh, the ministry, keeping in mind that there are already a number 
of uh, of data and there is already substantial capacity at the government level in relation to uh, climate change all we do is reinforcing that thank you thank you Etienne. um I, I think I need to close this closing session just to make sure we keep on time. But this is a really good opportunity to hang out there. We have posters on the Swalim project. I think we should have a coffee and speak afterwards. Um, I, I, that's sort of my moderator's call. I'm sorry. Um, I just I think I'd like to go to, to closing. But this is not just an ordinary closing. I think um, we also want to hear about another regional study that has been done on the state of land and water. Um, so this is a sort of a combined statement slash closing, um, and, and we will have this by uh, Mr. Jean-Marc Forez, who is Regional Program Leader for the FAO, Regional Office for Near East and North Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Teresa. And um, I think uh, when you told me we are going to have a combined uh, uh, discussion, uh, I, I said yes, but then I discovered it's very difficult to speak about something and close at the same time. Okay, we, we, can, we can certainly try. I'd like to thank the organizers for having thought about uh, a, a, a session that deals across different levels from global to regional and to local. And uh, this is really a very important discussion uh, coming from a regional office in which I am uh, now. Uh, this is a question that myself, I ask myself all the time. I've had the opportunity to work also at global level and at country level. And I do, and I'm really convinced that there is complementarity and we need to make use of this complementarity as much as we can. Uh, we have heard specific challenges of countries, Somalia, Palestine, and how they address them. And we see the, the commonalities, but also the differences between them, of course. We've heard the perspective of a regional body like IGAD and the work of a research institution like IGBA, who is maybe global in scope, but with a strong anchorage in our region, because uh, we have all those questions, all those problems of aridity and, and salinity. And, uh, um, so, and at global level, of course, uh, there is also an, an important uh, role to play. Of course, the focus is the very much on, on global policy dialogue, uh, advancing knowledge on key issues, offering platform for uh, knowledge exchange. So let me just spend a few minutes on what we do in FAO at global level to address this question of food security, water and climate that we have been discussing today. Uh, we have just adopted a climate change strategy and the purpose of this strategy is really to mainstream climate change in absolutely everything we do and at all levels. At, uh, we also have uh, established uh, uh, knowledge sharing platforms. Uh, at, uh, there is the global framework on water scarcity in agriculture, which brings together key players from different sectors to tackle the collective challenge on, of, on using water better in agriculture. And then this is complemented by a, a more recent uh, initiative, which we call the Interregional Technical Platform on Water Scarcity, which uh, our region has the honor to manage on behalf of all the uh, FAO regions. It is hosted uh, uh, by, uh, by the re Regional um, Office for the Near East and North Africa for a very simple reason also is that this is the most water scarce uh, region in the world. We also maintain global databases. One very well known is uh, Aquastat, the global information system on water in agriculture. When Aquastat was created, the reason is that everybody was talking about water, but nobody could even put a number, even at global level, about the, the, the water crisis. And now more uh, modern tools like uh, WAPO initiative funded by the Netherlands. This is a uh, real-time remote sensing monitoring on water use and water productivity and this is accessible to all so it cr cuts across all the regions and when you have all these data you also need to analyze them so that's what we do through the state of land and water resources uh, uh, the second edition of uh, that report at global level was issued uh, last year and in this region we felt that uh, the subject was so important that we needed to zoom on uh, specific issues related to land and water in the region. And the summary report that you can see here today uh, that has been launched two days ago in, a, in another event here at the COP 
brings together all the information that uh, FAO and other partners uh, got together and the uh, key messages and, and recommendations in terms of the challenges associated with uh, land and water. And as you can certainly guess, uh, uh, climate change uh, uh, is everywhere in, in this report as it uh, affects land and water systems that are already stretched to their limit in our region. So we have heat waves, increasing occurrence of, and intensity of drought, sand and dust storms. These are typical of, of this region and reduced water resource, all having a very profound impact on agriculture. We estimate, for instance, that drought, and this is a work done with IGBA, uh, are expected to increase in frequency by 150% between now and 2070. And uh, uh, this uh, brings me to a consideration when I was listening to the, to the panelists um, and uh, one of the comments uh, from, uh, from the audience about a uh, paradigm shift. Uh, I think we, have, we, are reached, we are reaching a point where we really need to make radical changes in, uh, in the way land and water are used and in the way uh, local communities are, are, are living out of them. Uh, if you have 20 years out of 22 with a climate uh, uh, extreme event, then maybe you will never have a normal year again. So uh, we, can we get back to the, the livelihoods that we knew, or do we have a situation combining increased population and, uh, and the climate effect by which we really need to change completely, radically what we offer to these populations because we cannot just adapt anymore. So, so this, this was something that uh, I got from uh, listening to you all. And I think uh, this, is a, this is a point that uh, it's very difficult to address because progressive adaptation is something that you can you can design you in, in your program, you can progressively adapt uh, your, your agricultural systems, but at some stage you get to a, a breaking point by which you really need to uh, find other options. And they are definitely not easy. We speak about diversification within agriculture, but also off-farm. Uh, that's certainly a very important option, but everything, I believe, a lot of these things will turn around what can we do with the water we have in this region and in the countries of uh, this region. So let me stop here. Thank you so much. I found it extremely interesting what I heard. And again, thank you for giving the opportunity to look across the different levels. I do hope that by working together, we can really bring the right solutions to the population that need it most. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jean-Marc, for that closing. And uh, I want to thank the panelists for a round of applause for everyone here and online as well uh, for giving us such great insights. And thank you so much for participating in this. Um, I am sorry for the questions that were not captured. I'm looking at you. Please, please, let's go and continue the conversation outside and join us for some fair trade coffee. Thank you so much. Thank you.